One of the nice things that we do here is, is the integration across different parts of the, uni parts of the university. And in our view, uh, human behavior is part of all of our energy, uh, energy, energy futures. So where do, where, do, where do people matter? Well, they matter in whether or not people will accept energy technologies. You can all think of the controversies having to do with nuclear power, uh, ca carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, Hydrofracking, as Jean allu alluded to, if people won't buy it, then we won't get it, or if we get it, it's only because people will be very unhappy uh, with, with it. If we provide, there are, there are technology, energy technologies whose success depends on whether individuals operate them. So we, if we provide fancy in-home devices to show people how well their energy works, will people understand them? Will they understand the signals that they get? Will they, will they use them? If we offer people direct load control say, so that you can uh, get a better deal on your electricity if your electric utility is allowed to cycle it off during peak demand periods, will people, uh, will people accept those deals? Will we have, as we would now it will soon be possible with um, uh, with smart grids, the opportunity of time of use pricing. So your electric utility will send you a signal that tomorrow electricity is going to be really, really expensive. If you don't use it tomorrow, you can save uh, save some money. So go to the mall when it's really uh, when it's really hot. What about energy conservation? We've all seen lists of 150 things that you could do to conserve energy. Do those make any sense to people? Are they feasible in their lives? It's easy to make a list. It may not be that easy to execute on it. Everything that we believe that we know about energy technolo technologies, come, we believe that we know it because somebody tells us that. So how well can we trust the experts who've done the analyses of the risks and, risks and benefits? Uh, human behavior is the cornerstone of human behavior of expert is the cornerstone of probabilistic risk analysis used to anticipate the reliability of technologies that we've never actually seen in operation based on our understanding of their components and how they fit together. There's uncertainty in all of these things. Whether or not we understand the uncertainty depends on the comprehensiveness of the team of experts that we've put together to see how a technology would work. When things go wrong, how well are we able to analyze and then take action uh, on, on them, and then all of the energy technologies depend on on people to keep them uh, going. Are they maintaining them the way they're, that they that that they should according to the according to the plans? Uh, when things go wrong, uh, does does the word get out? When people have innovations, are we able as a society to take uh, to take advantage uh, of them? So there are people everywhere to get the benefits and the risks of tech. Get the largest set of benefits and the smallest set of risks, we need to understand the human be behavior of the people who operate them, the people who consume them, the people who approve or disapprove of public uh, policies, and the people who claim to know how they work. How do we study uh, this? Well, a typical study will begin with very open-ended interviews, making certain that we understand the broadest range of views that people bring to bear on a, on a, technolo on, on a technology, because we're and one of the most robust of human uh, findings in the behavioral sciences is we exaggerate the extent to which we can read other people's minds and they can read, read ours. So if you don't talk to people, you don't know what, they're, what they're, they're thinking about. Typically, we'll follow up with structured surveys in order to find out the prevalence of beliefs in a particular population, whether it's experts or, or lay people. We'll do lab experiments in order to uh, refine our understanding of how particular behavioral processes work. And, but then we realize that if these are lab experiments, we often don't know how important the things are that we discover in the lab are in, in the real world. You run an experiment, whether it's in psychology or, or biology, in order to get the largest possible variability in the, in the phenomena that interests you, but they may be much larger in the lab than they are in, in the world. As a result, you need to do field experiments in order to see how fully functioning uh, interventions or technologies, uh, technologies work. A field experiments are all, if you are all complicated, oper complicated uh, operations. And uh, you can say, well, how we've, we've tried to introduce in-home devices or different kind of payment schemes for, for electricity. What do we know from them? So a naive way of accumulating those data would be to say, well, how often did it work and how often didn't it, didn't it work? 
If you do that, then you end up treating all studies as, as equal, where some of them are clearly better than others. So you can use a technique called meta-analysis, developed originally from clinical, uh, psychological clinical trials, now used in, in uh, medical to clinical trials to see what kind of a signal we have about, uh, about the efficacy of different, uh, different programs. You can develop communication programs so that you have the best chance of getting a fair judgment of, of technologies and so that people understand what they are. You can develop uh, consultation schemes. An interesting example is we recently had a blue ribbon, at the federal level, had a blue ribbon commission on, the, on, um, on America's nuclear future that was particularly prompted by trying to figure out what to do with, uh, with radioactive waste. The, com the commission decided to have a road show of consultations going around the country to see what people thought about it. A review by social scientists realized that they had scheduled this in a way, that they had set this up in a way that was actually likely to antagonize people rather than to make them feel more, more um, uh, inclusive, included in the, in, the, in the process. And in the final recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Commission was a way, it was, were recommendations for using scientifically sound to soliciting, uh, soliciting uh, public, uh, uh, involvement and finally something that Granger and his colleagues have been have been uh, pioneers in is how do you systematically elicit judgment from experts and then communicate it in people so that they know how good the best judgment of expert technology of, of our advanced technologies are. Here's a few of the projects that we've done in the in the past. My colleagues and I, 30 years ago, wrote a book for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission called Acceptable Risk. Amazingly, it's still in it's still in print. The, the NRC came to us because there had been a belief that if you made nuclear power s absolutely safe, then people would just accept it. And, and for those who followed the future of the industry, however strong the assurances and, and the engineering for safety, that was not, not enough. So we said, well, how, what are the different ways that you can do it? What are the f political and social philosophy you can have? Uh, Granger and I and, and some others about 20 years ago wrote a, a, a booklet that we sold several hundred thousand copies of at cost, otherwise we'd be wealthy by now, uh, about the health effects of 60, uh, 60 hertz electromagnetic fields that tried to level with the public about what we knew and what we, and what we, what we didn't know. And it's my impression that we significantly affected the national uh, debate on that. There been, we've done studies on the siting of, trans, of transmission lines where often you'll find opposition to transmission line based on health effects coming from people who are not that much concerned about health effects but actually concerned about being treated shabbily in the siting process. But being treated shabbily often doesn't have standing but you can argue about health effects and you can get have some attempt to get the kind of redress that wasn't, that was otherwise denied you. We've developed methodologies for how to set priorities among, uh, among risks. We've been studying for 20 odd years how, how people understand, uh, un understand climate change, what are the barriers to understanding, where the barriers to understanding often come from the expert community who explain things, uh, so explain things in a, in, a, in a poor way. We've done work, Paul Fishbeck and his colleagues have done work on the safety of tankers and oil, and, and, uh, oil platforms. What do we have going on now? Well, we're just about ready to send off for review a study of the Hawthorne effect looking at uh, uh, electricity field trials. So the Hawthorne effect is legendary in the social sciences, talks of, which is if you do things, sometimes people be, respond just because they're in a study. And we have a lot of attempts to affect, change people's behavior relative to electricity. They mostly, they're mostly in the gray literature of technical, technical reports, but they often have effects that are in the Hawthorne effect range. You, tell, you raise people's awareness of electricity and they'll change their behavior. So if all you need to do is, ra is raise people's behavior, well, you don't need in-home devices, you don't need a lot of the other expensive things that we're, we're doing. We've just completed a meta-analysis of smart grid field trials, finding most of them to be methodologically flawed and in ways that, based on the research literature, you can suggest the extent to which they mostly exaggerated the effects of their, of, of their trials. We've done work on the perceived risks and benefits of, of smart grid. We have a paper just coming out. Turns out people love smart, smart meters, except they expect them to be the equivalent of jetpacks. 
that uh, they, they love them because they think they'll do a whole lot more than they, uh, than they actually do, and they, um, and they have fears that people didn't think about it. We're looking at markets for ancillary services. Could you sell people a, a, the right to poor quality of ener energy that comes from, comes from renewables so as to en enable the system to absorb the unreliability that you, that, that, that you have? And we've looked at these other... Uh, at, at these other topics. So why do we do these things here? Well, we have a very broad set of, of disciplines. We have a long history of collaboration across colleges and within uh, uh, colleges. We have a tradition here of applying basic uh, research and a to see how much of what we believe to be true actually is true, it turns out to be valid in reality, and conversely, a long tradition of identifying basic, identifying basic research topics, not endogenously from our own research programs, from, from, from confrontation with applied uh, problems. And we all have this large, invisible colleagues of uh, colleges of colleagues. You know, often people who are happier working in traditional disciplines, but we can pull them into doing this kind of basic and applied research that this uh, institute is uh, dedicated to. So thank you.